Chapter Four of Ruth Erskine's Crosses. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ruth Erskine's Crosses by Pansy. Chapter Four. Bitter Herbs. The morning of the night which had closed in gloom opened to Ruth Erskine with a faint promise of better things. Not so much that either. Rather, she resolved on heroism. The sun shone, and the air was fresh with the breath of coming spring. The outlook seemed more hopeful. Ruth resolved upon trying Flossie's way. She would pray about this matter. She would nerve herself for duty and trial. She would bear whatever of disagreeableness came athwart her plans. No matter how obstinate or offensive this new woman proved herself to be on the question of wardrobe, she would bravely face the ordeal and do what she could. No amount of offensiveness should cause her to lose self-control. It was childish and useless to yield in this way and let inevitable trials crush one. She did not mean to do it. Her father should see that she could be as strong over real trials as Flossie Shipley could be over imaginary ones. For what had that little kitten ever had to try her? This Ruth said with a curl of her handsome upper lip. She went about her morning duties with something like the briskness of her old life, and settled herself to Bible reading, resolved on finding something to help her. She had not yet learned the best ways of reading in the Bible. Indeed, she had not given that subject the attention which Flossie had. To begin a chapter, and read directly and seriously through it, getting what information she could, was the most that she, as yet, knew about the matter. And the chapter occurring next to the one she had read yesterday was the fifth of Romans, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Thus on, through the solemn and wonderful chapter, heeding the words indeed, getting some sort of idea of St. Paul's meaning, and yet not making his experience personal in the least, not realizing that the sentence, We have peace with God, included Ruth Erskine, not seeing, at least, that it was a present promise referring to present experience, not realizing anything save a desire to be armed for unpleasant and continuous duties, and a dim idea that reading the Bible was one of the preparations which were given her to make. In much the same spirit she knelt to pray. She was humble, she was reverent, she was in earnest, she prayed for strength, for wisdom, for patience, and the words were strictly proper and in accordance with the desires. The prayer to a listener would have breathed the spirit of confidence and faith, yet it must be confessed that Ruth Erskine arose from her knees without any sense of having really communed with Christ, without any realization of his presence, and without any very definite expectation of receiving actual, practical benefit from the exercise. She did not realize the feeling, and yet she possessed somewhat of the same spirit of the child who prayed, Dear Jesus, help me to be good today. I know I can be good if I try, and I intend to try, but you can help me if you want to. Remember, I do not say that she realized it, but that does not alter the fact that she went out from her room to meet the trials of the day, strong in the strength of her own resolves. She repaired at once to Mrs. Judge Erskine's room, determined to be very composed and patient, and to combat whatever disagreeable or dissenting thing might be said with forbearance and kindness. Mrs. Erskine's objection to new and fine clothing must be overcome, but it should be done wisely. She resolved to say nothing to Susan beforehand. She would not admit, even to herself, that her father's evident confidence in Susan's powers was a trial to her. But, all the same, she determined to show him that she, too, had powers, and that she could manage matters without Susan's help. Alas for Ruth! Mrs. Erskine was not in the least averse to fine feathers, she was not lofty, nor angry, nor hurt. She was good-naturedly and ungrammatically and exasperatingly loquacious. It would have been much easier for Ruth to endure ill-temper. 
She was nerved for that. Unconsciously she had planned for and prayed for self-control to enable her to endure not what she would meet in Mrs. Erskine, but what she would have had to contend with in herself had she been in Mrs. Erskine's place. And as, given the same circumstances, the two would act in a totally different manner, failure was inevitable. "'Come in,' said Mrs. Erskine heartily, in answer to Ruth's slow knock. "'Land alive! Come right in! Don't stop to rap! What's the use of being so particular with one's folks? I been a-wishin' you would run in and have a chat. I was tellin' your pa only last night how chirk and nice we could all be here if you would be sort of sociable, you know, and not so stiff and proud-like. Not that you mean to be proud, I suppose. Susan says you don't. She says it's natural for some folks to be haughty. I suppose it is. But land alive, I'm glad I'm not one of them kind. Haughty folks always did shrivel me right up. Set down here by the fire. I think these grates is real comfortable. I told your pa last night that I wouldn't have shivered over an old barn of a wood stove all these years if I'd known what comfortable things there was in the world. How dreadful pale you look. Is it natural for you to look so like a ghost all the time? I am not accustomed to having a great deal of color in my face, I believe, Ruth answered, sitting squarely and stiffly in the most uncomfortable chair she could find in the room, and feeling, just then, that to be an actual ghost would have been a positive relief. Well, now, I don't believe it's nature for any human being to be so like a sheet as that. If I was your pa, I'd have you through a course of medicine in less than no time. You need strengthening up. You ought to have some Peruvian bark or some quassia chips or some kind of bitter stuff steeped up for you to drink. It would do you a power of good, I know it would. You just let me fix you up a mess like I do Susan and see what it'll do for you. Surprise your pa with the change in you, I dare say. Poor Ruth. She felt as though stuff that was bitter enough had been mixed and steeped and held to her lips and that she was being obliged to drink it to the very dregs. Did she need it? Was it possible that the divine physician saw her need of such bitter herbs as these, which had fallen to her lot? She started and even flushed a little over the sudden thought. She did not believe it. This was her father's sin, not hers. It had only fallen upon her because of the old solemn law, the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited upon the children. She hurried her thoughts away from it. It would not do to sit in that room with that woman staring at her and indulging questionings like these. I came in to see if I could be of any assistance to you in the way of shopping. You will need something new, I suppose, before the gathering of friends which my father proposes to have. Ruth had decided to take it as a matter of course that new garments were to be bought and thus forestall, if she could, haughty objections. She need not have been thus careful. Mrs. Erskine had stated truly that she was not one of the haughty sort. She had no objection to any number of new dresses, and to their being made as elaborately as possible. "'Now you speak of it, I dare say I do,' she said, leaning back complacently in her comfortable little rocker. "'In fact, your pa spoke of that very thing this morning. He said like enough you would tend to it, and he filled my pocket-book up handsome.' There ain't a stingy streak about your pa. I knew that years and years ago when he was a young man. It was the very first thing that drawed me to him, the free kind of way in which he threw around his money. It seemed so noble-like, especially when I was driving every nerve to keep soul and body together, and lived among folks that didn't dare to say their bodies was their own, for fear they would have em seized on for debt, and took to jail. I tell you, that was livin'. You don't know nothing about it, and I hope to the land that you never will. What could Ruth do but groan inwardly, and wish that her father had been, in his youth, the veriest miser that ever walked the earth? Anything so that this terrible woman would not have been drawed to him. She tried to hurry the question. What have you thought of getting? she asked, nervously twisting and untwisting the tassels of the tidy against which she leaned, and feeling disagreeably conscious that a glow of color had mounted to her very temples in her efforts at self-control. "'Land alive, I don't know. 
I've thought of a dozen different dresses since your pa told me this morning what he wanted. He wants things to be awful nice, I can see that. And why shouldn't he? A man that's got money and is free with it has a right to say what he will have, I'm sure. I think it ought to be something bright, like something, well, bridey, you know. This last was such a distressing little simper that it was almost more than Ruth could do to keep from rushing from that awful room and declaring to her father that she would have no more to do with this thing. He should fight his dreadful battles alone. But outwardly she held still, and the shrill, uncultured little voice went on. You see, I am almost like a bride, meeting your pa's friend so for the first time, though land knows it is long enough ago that I planned what to wear when I should meet em. It took longer to get ready than I expected. There was not even a spice of bitterness in this sentence. If there had been, if there had been a suggestion that this woman felt somewhat of her own wrongs, Ruth thought that she would have borne it better. But the tone was simply contemplative, as of one who was astonished, in a mild way, over the tragedy that life had managed to get up for her. "'You see,' she continued, "'I hadn't a chance for much dressin' or thinkin' about it. Your pa was so weak that I had almost all I could do to fix bitters and things, and manage to keep the breath of life in his body. And many's the time when I thought he'd beat and die right before my face and eyes in spite of me. Then he went off on that journey afore he was able, and I've always believed, and always shall, that he didn't rightly know what he was about after that for quite a spell. So now I think more than likely it would please him to have things kind of gay and lively. I ain't said anything about it to Susan. She hadn't no special interest in dressing up anyway, and she and I don't always agree about what looks nice, but I think your pa would like it if I had a green silk. Bright, rich green, you know, nothing dull and fady. I saw one when I was a girl. Fact is, I sewed on it, and it was for a bride, too. And I said to myself then, says I, if I'm ever a bride, I'll have a dress as much like this as two peas. I've been a good while about it, but that's neither here nor there. I've got a beautiful red bow, that wide, rich-looking kind of ribbon. A woman gave it to me for tending up her poor girl afore she died. She had the consumption, and I took care of her off and on a good share of the fall, and she gave me this ribbon. It's real nice, though Lan knows I didn't want pay for doing things for her poor girl. T'wan't pay, neither, for the matter of that. It was just to show they felt grateful, you know, and I've always set store by that ribbon. I've never wore it, because Susan, she thought it wasn't suited to our way of livin', and no more it wasn't, though we lived nice enough in a small way. Your pa never skimped us on money, though, land alive. I didn't dream of his havin' things about him like he has, and I was always for tryin' to lay up, cause I didn't know how much money he had, and I didn't know but he'd come to poverty some day. Rich folks do, and I was for savin', and Susan didn't object. Susan is a good girl as ever was. And so the red bow is just as nice as ever it was, not a mite soiled nor nothing, and I think it would go lovely with a green silk dress, don't you? No, said Ruth, severely and solemnly. Not another word could she have forced her white lips to say, and I don't know how to explain to you what awful torture this talk was to her. The truth was, to those of you who do not, because of a fine, subtle inner sympathy, understand it already, it is utterly unexplainable. "'Land alive!' said Mrs. Erskine, startled by the brief, explosive answer, and by the white, set lips. "'Don't you? Now, I thought you would. You dress so like a picture yourself. I thought you would know all about it, and your pa said you knew what was what, as well as the next one.' Think of Judge Erskine's aristocratic lips delivering such a sentence as that. Now, I had a geranium once when I was a girl. It was the only pretty thing I had in the world, and I set store by it, for more reasons than one. It was give to me by my own aunt on my father's side. It was pretty nigh all she had to give, poor thing. They was dreadful poor like the rest of us, and she give me this the very winter she died. I had it up in my room, and it kept a-blowing and blowing all winter long. I never see the like of that thing to blow. 
and I used to stand and look at it just between daylight and dark. It stood right by my one window, where the last streak of daylight come in, and I used to squeeze in there between the table and the wall to make my buttonholes, and when it got so dark I just couldn't make another stitch, I'd stand and look at the thing all in blow, and thought I'd never see anything so pretty in all my life, and I make up my mind then and there that a green silk dress about the color of them leaves, and a red ribbon about the color of them blossoms, would be the prettiest thing to wear in the world. I got the bow a good many years ago, and I was always kind of savin' on it up, waiting for the dress. Just here there was the faintest little breath of a sigh. But then, if you don't think it would be the thing, why, I'm willing to leave it to you. Your pa said you'd see that everything was ship-shape. I think, said Ruth, and her voice was hollow even to herself, I think that my father's taste would be a plain black silk with white lace at the throat. If you desire to please him, I am sure you will make that choice. Why, exclaimed Mrs. Judge Erskine, and she couldn't help looking a bit dismayed. Land alive, do you think so? Black! Why, it will make folks think of a funeral, won't it? No, said Ruth. Black is worn on all occasions by persons who know enough to wear it. Then she arose. She had reached the utmost limit of endurance. Another sentence from this woman she felt would have driven her wild. Yet she was doomed to hear one more before she closed the door after herself. Well, now, if you honestly think it will be best, I suppose I'll agree to it, as your pa seemed to think things must go your way. But I don't quite like it, just because it seems kind of bad luck. I don't believe them notions about black clothes at merry-makings, you know, though when I was a girl folks honestly thought so, and it seems kind of pokerish to run right into em. I never would begin to clean house of a Friday, some bad luck was sure to come, and as for seeing the moon over my left shoulder, I won't do it now, not if I can help it. But black silk ain't so funeral as bombazine and such, and I suppose— here Ruth slammed the door, and put both trembling hands to her ears, and ran across the hall to the refuge of her own room, and closed, and locked, and bolted her door. As for Mrs. Erskine, she relapsed of necessity into silence, and for the space of five minutes, ceased her rocking, and looked meditatively into the glowing grate. Then she arose, and for the second time that morning, her speech was heralded by the breath of a sigh, as she said aloud, I ain't no ways certain that I can ever make head or tail to that girl. Then she went to her new and elegant dressing bureau, and opened a drawer, and drew from under a pile of snowy clothing a little box, and took therefrom, wrapped in several folds of tissue paper, the treasured bow. She had kept it choicely for fourteen years, always with a dim sense of feeling that the time might come, when life would so have opened to her that she would be able to add to it the green silk dress and appear in triumph. Besides, it represented to her so much gratitude and affection, and there was actually on her small, worn, withered face the suspicion of a tear as she carefully folded and replaced it. Her audible comment was, A black silk dress and a white lace bow, land alive! End of chapter 4 Recording by Tricia G.